Welcome to First Thought, a podcast by Galway International Arts Festival. I'm Tiernan Henry, host of the festival's Vinyl Hours. Vinyl Hours is a series of conversations with artists and creatives, tracing a musical journey through the soundtrack of their lives. Tom Waits reckons that songs are really just interesting things to be doing with the air, and who'd argue with him? And here in Vinyl Hours, we think talking about them isn't too shabby either. You can listen to the full playlist on Galway International Arts Festival's Spotify page, and if you like what you hear, please consider making a donation to Galway International Arts Festival, a non-profit organisation bringing the arts to people in Ireland and around the world. Head to giaf.ie and click Donate. Today's guest is singer, songwriter and actor Steve Wall. Best known as the frontman of The Stunning, Steve's written songs that defined and are part of the DNA of a whole generation of Irish people. In recent years, he's also carved out a career as an actor in Ireland, in the UK and internationally taking on everything from the hapless and freewheeling Uncle Danny in Moon Boy to the harrowing and broken Chet Baker in My Foolish Heart. He'll be off to Spain shortly to shoot a six-part high-octane epic western for the BBC and Amazon Studios, and he's just released a fine summer song, Rise With The Sun, which is available on Bandcamp. But for today, we're here to talk about some of the music that moves him. And remember, the Stunning's Heineken Big Top gig has been rescheduled to Sunday 17th of July 2022, Tickets are available at giaf.ie. Without further ado, enjoy Vinyl Hours with Steve Wall. Steve, it's great to have you here. Thank you for doing this. Turning, great to talk to you. Yeah. And uh, it's funny when you hear um, like the Galway Arts Festival show that was supposed to have happened in July 2020 is now two years later. Yeah. And, you know, we're not getting any younger, you know, so people... <laughs> People have been joking with me that my, my usual search of rock and roll split legged jump in the air at the end of brewing up a storm, you know, will I still be able to do that in two years time? And will <laughs> it know, be well, an earlier like, show? <laughs> will it be an earlier <laughs> show? Be, you know, a three o'clock show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking we should, you know, just play a joke in the audience that we, we, we enter, you know, but all these shows in 20, we come out in Zimmer frames, Yeah, you know, and then, and then, and, <laughs> just jump out of them then you know <laughs> are we here yet <laughs> so, yeah 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 <laughs> and, i mean i suppose we talk a little bit about it but i know uh, certainly as a musician and, and just i suppose anyone working in as a person working in the arts it must have been a, a really complicated and difficult year for you yeah it it has been um i, I think for for people who are kind of who have managed to work through it hmm. um it's probably hard to understand what it's like for people who have been unable to work and, you know, self-employed people in the entertainment industry who are so used to um, hustling all the time, you know, like mm. work is always, you have to put yourself out there. And very often it's not like a salary job where, you know, you're getting two weeks holidays in August. You kind of work whenever the call comes through, you know, so you, you work at that kind of level all the time. But um, this, so this has been really strange. I mean, the last time, we played in front of an audience with the stunning was December 29th, 2019. Right. Yeah. So like we're into 2021 now. Yeah. Uh, we haven't played since 2019. The last yeah. acting job I did was the Southwest release for RTE and that finished shooting in November, 2019. And I right. haven't, I haven't acted since then. Yeah. So this, this next job that you, that you, you mentioned there, which was actually only just publicly announced at two o'clock today. And uh, I, I've I known saw it about under, it. I saw your tweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been di- I've been dying to let people know yeah. about that since last Christmas when yeah. I got cast in it. But that was supposed to start shooting in February, yeah. and so that's been put back till mm-hmm. uh, June. But it's been for me that has kept me going, just knowing that um, I have that job coming up. Yeah. That's really been a big help, just for my general mental health. You know, reason yeah. to get out of bed in the morning i mean there have been like and that song actually rise with the sun i had a bit of fun with the lyrics on on that i did i didn't want to write it like it was a a pandemic related song or anything because i mean it it works for any time but uh it is actually pretty much written about that sort of brain fog i mean there have been days where i literally had no idea what day of the week it was you know yeah yeah i think we're all we've all kind of come through that interesting times Listen, we'll yeah. we, we get started with this anyway. So your first choice on your list is Jump Around by House of Pain, which you can hear on Steve's playlist on the International Arts Festival Spotify page. So why this track to kick things off, Steve? 
Uh, because it's a real kind of a kickoff track, basically. It's it's one of those songs that the very first time I heard it, it just was immediate. Um, for starters, it has that incredible groove to it. It has that sort of head, but you just cannot listen to it without bobbing your head yeah. or tapping your yeah. foot. And there's also, of course, there's the attitude to it as well, or attitude. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's... Um, <laughs> You know, it just came out of a time when I suppose most kind of hip hop and rap coming out of the States, um, you know, you had, it, it was, I suppose, Public Enemy would have been the major influence on that track, you know, with the kind of the siren kind of thing yeah. going on in the background and all of that. But, um, and it would, you know, you, you would, would have thought at the, the time that only kind of black um, hip hop rap artists could produce something like that. But then you had these guys that were sort of their, they were waving the kind of the Irish flag or the Irish American flag. Yeah. And this was very strong and their identity was the Irish thing, you know? And um, I remember we played, we used to play kind of probably every year or a couple of times a year over in the States, most of the East Coast around that time. And um, that track was everywhere. And anywhere that it was an Irish bar or an Irish yeah, audience, there it was. <laughs> jump around and come on, and everybody would jump, jump around, around. <laughs> you know. So there was a lot of just crazy times to that song. But I, th I think it was it was a time as well when you had like uh, you know Irish Americans, young Irish Americans had something that they could identify with. And yeah. It was like this is ours, you know. Yeah, yeah. But just great. It's just a great track. Yeah, it is. And I, I found a great quote by an American writer, and she said that. They're the first and only members of hip hop's Irish American Thug Life Hall of Fame who earned their spot in that imaginary pantheon with this killer blast of rapid fire rap bravado. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. I mean, you know, regardless of sort of you know what they're kind of trying to represent or that, it's just a killer tune. It's just yeah. really well put together. It sounds great. Uh, the delivery is fantastic. It's just a real. It's just a. And it still works. It's it's just, I think it yeah. just, you're right. I think absolutely. It's it's a great way to start. I think anything because I think also it just it instantly relaxes everyone. And I think there's a component of you know this should be played at every Irish wedding. You know, <laughs> it's it just you know. when I hear I just want to go out and drink pints. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and now more than ever of because I, I haven't done it in a year. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It, it really is. It's a blast of a song, to be quite honest. And now, funny enough, because the next few songs on your list, um, they're much, much more, I would say, about the voice. You know, the music's important, but the, I would yeah. guess that, that the voice is probably really important. I, I actually didn't even think about I didn't put them in any particular order. So that's uh, pretty much just as I thought of them, yeah. you know. Well, what I like doing with these is I like trying to, I start looking at the list and going, oh yeah, look, that works really well with that, you know, so, and I yeah, don't change yeah. it. But what's interesting, every time I've done this with people is, as we start talking about it, you kind of get this sense of, one is how unfair it is to ask people to reduce everything down to six or seven tracks. You know, I think that's so unfair. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I, I'd say if I asked you tomorrow, I'm not saying you'd come up with a completely different list, but you'd go, oh yeah, I have to get this in or I have to get this in. Yeah. So your second choice, it's from 2014, um, but it's Beck and it's doing the song. It's Beck doing Morning is the song uh, from Morning Phase. It's Beck's 12th album. Um, and why why Beck and why this song in particular? Um, I've always been a huge Beck fan ever since. Um, I think probably the first track I heard was Loser, you know, back mm. in uh, the early 90s. And um, he's just an incredible original artists very prolific uh, he borrows from things you know he, you know just like sort of um bob dylan with a sampler um yeah. he's very you know he borrows from different genres and everything mixes it up and does something really interesting hmm. um and i think the production is just absolutely flawless on it it's uh, he puts such thought and uh, consideration into the whole um, production process. I mean, I, re I read a fantastic interview um, about the production of that album and just how he decided all the songs are very slow, also recorded at a very high bit rate, which is not something I'd bore, bore listeners with, but it's got a real density. It's like, it's like it was recorded onto tape, really yeah. high quality tape machine. It's just sonically absolutely beautiful. And uh, with that track, I, th I think when you're, you know, picking songs for a thing like this, I, I kind of picked them on songs that I just, I suppose there were songs that I couldn't get out of my head and songs that meant a lot to me. And 
I suppose I relate this song to uh, a very bad year in my family um, where we had family tragedy and, and the, my mother was very ill at the time as well and she was, you know, gradually passing away. And so there was a year, 2017, where I was just driving every week to um, a hospital somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. uh, usually over in the West. Um, so I was just traveling between hospitals every week and sometimes I'd, I'd leave Dublin like very early in the morning and I'd hit the road. And the minute I'd hit the motorway, I'd often put on that album. So when I hear it, I actually see, I see that lovely part of the country on a sunny day on the motorway, green fields, sunshine, and just the blacktop curving ahead, you know? Yeah. And the various times of the year when it was changed, you know, times it was foggy and raining and snowy but usually i remember the sunny days funnily mm -hmm. enough and uh just that song there's something about it it just brings me back to that it, it's not that it reminds me of anything unhappy but it just it reminds me of i suppose the state of mind i was in and that that song and the sound of it kind of enveloped me and certainly was felt like a kind of a, a musical hug yeah, that's, I think that's a perfect way of describing it. I, I'm listening to the same listening to Beck for Donkey's Years. And I think what I really like about this track is there's so much space in it. Mm. And and it's it's very inviting. You know, he's so unhurried in his delivery. Yeah. And it's it's not casual, but just unhurried. Yeah. yeah. And it really is a sort of, yeah, let's just, you know, I, I, to me, it's a walking song. That's what I think when I hear it. You just think I'm yeah. walking on a beach. Or I'm walking yeah. somewhere listening to this, and for you, it's a driving song, you know. And you kind of think, and but you feel like you're not. You've got this companion with you. Yeah, and it's not a spiritual thing, I, I don't think, but it's just you kind of think, yeah, this is a nice. It's like a a, a, a landscape that he's invited you to to discover with him. You yeah. Know? Um, and I think music means I think can mean an awful lot to people at different times of their life, and I think we get a lot of solace as well from different types of music. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's just this companion. You think this is something that's always been there for me. Um, yeah, I've always got been able to just get lost in it, or you know, whatever. Yeah. Just find yeah. space. And I it. suppose and, now, I mean, it, it's it's much more accessible, even though Spotify. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I, I hate it, but I can see. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable how um, you know. I've yeah. often told this story before about how in uh, when I was a you know a teenager and living in in Estimon in County Clare. And I remember listening to Dave Fanning's show one night, yeah. and he played um, he played the, the Clash's new single at the time, which was "White Man in the Hammersmith Palais." Mm -hmm. And for some reason, just something about that song just really resonated with me. And the next bank holiday weekend, I used to I used to sort of get on the bus and go up to Dublin and with my pocket money, and I'd I'd have enough money maybe to buy three albums or something yeah. like that, and vinyl, you know, because mm -hmm. so uh, there weren't even CDs at the time, and um, so. It was a seven-hour journey down the bus, <laughs> <laughs> the bus from Enniskillen <laughs> to Dublin. Yeah. It was seven hours. It went through every bloody town in Ireland <laughs> across the country. It went through different centuries. So, yeah, and then I remember I, I would go to um, there was a it was like a punk rock record shop called Advance Records. It was right across the road from the Gaiety Theatre. Yeah, and I remember standing there, and I was like this, you know, young skinny fellow from the West of Ireland. There was a lot of punks with leather jackets and mohawks and tattoos and stuff, all standing outside it. And I remember there being there thinking that you know I'll wait for them to go away before <laughs> I go in. Like, I'd, I'd never really seen real life punk before yeah, you know yeah. i'd seen them on tv and yeah. sort of the, i remember the, the the video for the police's message in a bottle and you saw all these punks queuing up and susie and the banshee look alike and all i thought maybe they were going to attack me or something but um little did i know they were absolute you know pussy yeah. cats yeah. and uh you know and i'd be one at one point and when you were like a kid listening to music what was there much music in the house first off or what or was it that the stuff that you were hearing either you know through school or you know just on the radio no it was it was very much in the house um basically when um you know my early years uh I, you know grew up in dublin my mm -hmm. mother was from the liberties and uh so we lived for a while you know after she got married and i was the the, the eldest and uh i think there was four young kids at the time we lived with her parents for a while in harold's cross in dublin and 
the house was full of records because my mother had like you know there was there was six girls and a boy in the family there was seven of them yeah so there was all the vinyl my grandfather had great records as well he was into stuff like um you know sinatra dean martin mm. brooke benton perry como all the crooners you know yeah. there was also there was records um great records big band stuff like glenn miller and mm -hmm. Art, artie shaw all that kind of stuff and uh then there was all the records from you know my aunts so the older aunts like like my mother had stuff like um lots of ella fitzgerald sarah vaughn yeah uh, uh martha reeves um she was into classical as well so there would have been you know vorjak and De frederick delius and then the, you know the, my younger aunts then had stuff like the kinks the beatles the stones yeah. david essex and then one of my aunts went to work for a company called ktel oh i remember that yes <laughs> and they put out compilations so yeah. there's loads of ktel compilation yeah. albums in yeah. the house so it was you know the house is full of records so when i was old enough to actually put on to use the record player probably from about the age of um, maybe seven or eight or something like that. I was putting on records myself and just sitting on the floor in, in the in the sitting room, in the front room. And I mean, the, the, the stuff I started listening to first really was the Beatles stuff because yeah. it was just so immediate. The songs were about two minutes long and um, the early ones. And mm -hmm. uh, they were just so immediate, the melodies and everything. And I remember sitting on the floor as well and going through, you know, you'd read the sleeve notes on the back of an album as well at Saint while you were listening to it. And some of them had lyrics and if it was a gatefold sleeve. And so there was a lot of, I think from that time growing up with, with all that music in the house, I definitely think that formed me, you know, mm -hmm. as a songwriter as well, because I was listening to stuff, you know, I was like 10 years old and younger and I was listening to Cole Porter and yeah. singing singing Cole Porter songs, you know, and just this few have surpassed uh, his lyrical ability, yeah. you know, to this day. And um, I loved all that stuff. So that's very much, that, that's still very much a kind of a thing uh, in my songwriting. I, I look back to, um, to those kind of Tin Pan Alley songwriters because mm -hmm. just lyrically they're just superb, especially the likes of Cole Porter. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about songwriting, so I suppose we might as well bring uh, your man in. So uh, back from 1965, this is this is uh, your next choice um, is Bob Dylan, and it's it's a really interesting choice. It's "She Belongs to Me," which is probably one of his most generous, and I think one of his most affirming songs. And I suppose this song kind of came from the middle of that those mad years. I suppose um, you know, in, in like in 18 months, he made bringing it all back home. I was 61 and blonde and blonde and then fell off a motorbike. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, was Dylan much uh, of your, of that early listening for you? Um, or, or is it something that, that came later to you? Dylan probably um, came to me when I was probably around 16, I'd say, uh, when I started really listening to Dylan. And I can't remember where I heard him first, probably on the radio or something, mm. probably heard some stuff as, you know, 14 15 16 around that age and then i remember an album appeared in the house um it was a i think the first one we had was like a, a greatest hits yeah. that was um, put together in the 80s or something on columbia and um it had a bunch of like you know tambourine man and all this kind of stuff and it was worn out in the house you know mm -hmm. between my brothers and sisters and myself and uh, then i started to get more albums you know I mean, like I couldn't afford albums back then. So it was a big deal to go out and buy a record, you know. Uh, also d down in West Clare, the nearest record shop was 17 miles away in Ennis. <laughs> and it was mostly show band records, yeah. you know. Yeah. These uh, Irish show bands, everybody with like blow dried hair and uh, crazy blue suits and lots yeah. of velvet and all the pl platform shoes, all that kind of thing. So, you know, you'd be hard pressed sometimes finding Bob Dylan um, in terms of that back then. Mm. But, um, yeah, so by the time I was 17, I was like a big a committed Dylan fan and I was, I taught myself guitar and I was playing Bob Dylan songs. You know, I, I learned guitar basically from a Dylan songbook and a Beatles songbook. And uh, so I knew loads of his songs on guitar. And then um, when I was uh, around 18 and I went to Germany, oh no, I was 19 and I went to Germany. There was two guys from Ennis Diamond had got jobs in a, uh, in a factory down in Bavaria. And my, my, my dad, uh, 
heard about it in the pub one night, you know, that there was two lads of the town were making a fortune. Anyway, so I was packed off. <laughs> <laughs> I was packed off and uh, I spent the summer in, in Germany um, and it was, uh, it was an amazing time, actually. It was a bit of a life-changing experience for me, but I brought my guitar and I became a bit of a hit in the, in the town because I, I started playing in the, in the local pub where all the young people drank and I was playing all the songs I knew, like Dylan, Neil Young, all that gut kind of stuff, Beatles, you know. And there were, it was funny because in Ireland, so many young people play music, but there, there was nobody else really. No one else yeah. had a guitar and would join yeah. in or it. It was just me. And uh, the two, my two Irish friends that were there, the lads working in the factory, they loved it because there was more and more girls coming down <laughs> to the pub every night. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the one that ended up playing all the time yeah. while they were, you know, chatting up the girls. They were management, and, uh, obviously, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so when I came back from Germany and I started writing songs and this was around the time, it was a few years before the stunning. And I had tried to write a song that was kind of like my blowing in the wind. And it was mm. actually called Brewing Up a Storm. But it was right. a very different, very, it, the, the lyrics were the same practically. And I had the chorus, but it was very different. It wasn't like the rock song it became. Yeah, it was. It was more like kind of blowing in the wind. It was, right. it was a yeah. Dylan, Dylan-esque yeah. kind of yeah. s strummy type type of yeah. song. And uh, I remember then when we were rehearsing in the early days of the Stunning, and we were trying to introduce kind of more original songs because our, our set had a lot of covers in it in the early mm -hmm. days. We were trying to introduce more original music, and I started playing this for the lads, and I said, you know, this is what I have, and I was strumming it and they were playing along and it wasn't really working and then someone suggested i pick up the electric guitar and uh so it, it didn't really work to strum the chords and so i started picking out the, yeah. the notes and then it kind of morphed into the the, the opening riff mm -hmm. and then it got faster and stuff like that and then it, it became kind of a much different yeah. song but it was like originally inspired by Bob Dylan. <laughs> by a summer in Germany. <laughs> and a summer. And a summer in Germany. <laughs> and, and, and like at what point do you, do you think you decided that you wanted to give music a go? And, and, or, or was it as conscious a decision as that? Yeah, it was very conscious because when, you know, I didn't do very well on my leave insert. Um, I went to the, uh, I was, I went to the Christian Brothers down in Estime and, and back, but I did my leave insert a long time ago, like you're talking in 1980. And, there was no career guidance. We yeah. were we were basically we were um, we were bussed off to do these exams for uh, the Department of Post and Telegraphs, the ESB. Oh, I remember those. The, yeah, the civil the service banks, exams and yeah, and the banks yeah. and the civil service and all this. Yeah. And should, gee, I had no interest in that. Yeah. And like, why we were all sent to do those is just I just have no idea. So mm. that that there was no career guidance. It was just okay. like get these lads jobs and that's it. You know. Yep. So um, I ended up going to college to do um the, the only reason i wanted to go to college was because i thought i might meet you know like-minded people um that would form a band with me or that mm -hmm. i could join a band or something i was really wanted to do music at that age you know i was um 18 and uh so i took the first course that i was accepted into which was mechanical engineering in the in the rtc in Galway. Right. And how I got into mechanical engineering, I have no idea <laughs> because I didn't do I didn't do physics, and I and I think I failed maths. Right. So, so you kind I was of cornerstones of what they need. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's uh, that was Galway, yeah, and Galway was actually amazing then. It mm. really was. And I I joined a band. I saw a band play. They were called New Testament, and they played lunch lunchtime concert. And they were the band was formed by a guy called Eamon Dowd um from county mayo and uh, they were just really cool they were a mixture of the clash and echo and the bunny men and joy division yeah and i after the gig i went up to talk to them afterwards and say and i said i think you need a rhythm guitar player and uh, <laughs> and i joined them and that, so that was that was uh that was a great experience you know and as you were doing that did you at, at any point did you feel no no i need to go on as opposed to sort of being with a band that you joined that, yeah you know, you kind of said, all right, maybe not even mu musically different, but maybe just the things you wanted to do or places yeah. you wanted to musically explore. Well, what happened was that after after a couple of years of doing that, I kind of felt like um, I didn't want to do it anymore, you know, mm. and that my real interest lay in acting. And um, because that was something that was always there. Like, and I actually applied to a couple of the acting colleges in London, like oh, yeah, RADA okay, and yeah. 
Lambda and all those yeah. places. And that was what I was really interested in at the time. And I didn't get into any of them. Mm. So it was the RTC in Galway doing yeah. mechanical engineering. <laughs> and uh, so after the couple of years, when I finished there, um, I failed mechanical engineering, by the way, and I, I managed to um, switch into business studies. Right. As you can see, that was a great success as well. And uh, <laughs> so, um, but I, I managed to continue to play with the band. But mm. when we finished in, in the RTC, the band kind of fell apart. And I then decided that I wanted to have a go at acting. So I actually walked into the Druid Theatre Company one day and asked for a job. And uh, Mary Mullen interviewed me. Right. And somehow I talked my way into getting a job at Druid. Uh, I don't think I was getting paid, but I was, uh, I was like an intern, I suppose, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was doing all kinds of things. I eventually, I think I did get paid, but I, I started off doing all kinds of things. Like I got a walk-on role in um, a Tom Murphy play, a lunchtime play called On the Outside. And I also understudied uh, one of the lead actors in it. I think it was Melissa Stafford. Right. And... Um, so all of a sudden I was in this theater world and I absolutely loved it. And I, I stayed with Druid for about two years and I worked on all kinds of things. I, I had a couple of walk-on parts. I was assistant stage manager. Mm. I, I remember helping Roger Doyle with the soundtrack to an amazing play called Tis Pity She's a Whore. So I was, you know, I was with all these people, you know, Sean McGinley, Mary Mullen, Ray McBride, Malia Stafford, mm. Jane Brennan, this, you know, this just incredible company. I have very fond memories of that time in, in Galway. And I saw amazing plays. I was yeah. actually the sound operator on Conversations on a Homecoming. So I, I saw that play, I don't know how many times, and I was, right. in, that I was in that little box. The little box, yeah. Because <laughs> um, I got trained in. Spud, who was the resident sound person there had to go to do another job or something i got trained in so i was the person there with the faders and yeah doing the sound effects and everything so i watched that play every night and never tired of it mm -hmm. and i just saw incredible during that over that two-year period i saw incredible shows there and um so that really kind of um reignited in me uh desire like to get into acting so i then left druid and i moved up to dublin to pursue an acting career and after a year on the dole, I was getting yeah. nowhere. Yeah. And, uh, and I just said, you know what? I'm going to form a band because it's the one thing that you can just do. You don't need somebody to say, we're going to hire you. You know, now you yeah. can, somebody doesn't decide when you work as a musician, you decide when you work, mm -hmm. you make things happen. So that was almost like a, a eureka moment for me when, when I realized I can just put an ad in hot press yeah. and start meeting musicians. And that's what I did. So the stunning grew out of that. And uh, it's funny because I, I hadn't intended entirely on leaving acting behind, but then right. that's what happened, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I suppose you, you get taken off in different directions. Yeah. And I suppose, as you say, I think all the probably in the early 80s was certainly for the, the on the theatre side of things, was it, you know, an awfully exciting place to be. It, it's, it was a very interesting time in Galway. And, you know, even in that time, I mean, we didn't know it. We didn't know that that was going to be such... An important time in Galway. Yeah, there were all these things happening. I mean, you know, you had a fantastic music scene that was just really starting to get going, and you had the Galway Arts Festival, which mm -hmm. became probably the one of the most prominent festivals in Europe, if not the world. You mm -hmm. know, it certainly it really was. It really well respected. People came from all over. The Galway Arts Festival was the arts event of the summer. Yeah, you know, not just in Ireland. And then you had Machnus, uh, which we were all a part of. Actually, in the early days of Machnus, um, we were. Um, we were unemployed when the stunning in the early days the stunning with no income so we worked on the fall scheme and we were yeah. employed by Machnus and which was just an amazing thing to be a part of at that er early stage you know mm -hmm. do, doing the first mock the first parades you know we were yeah. all, all three of us in the stunning were in the first parades and but it was just an incredible time this the, the amount of stuff that was going on and Galway this the city was very conducive to it at the time i thought because there was space it yeah. wasn't this is pre-celtic tiger you know what i mean yeah. so artists weren't being priced out of it it's what always happens you know um our artists often if it's an undesirable part of town they make it cool and next minute the yeah. starbucks and the gap and and the boots mm -hmm. chemists move in and it's like good luck yeah okay listen we'll go on but uh, just a few years ago, i remember reading a piece by uh, there was a B belfast writer and poet uh, kieran carson and he talked about how songs and tunes how they could change and bend 
and you could create a landscape if you want, like a song or a tune could be a landscape and that singers and musicians would learn to read the maps of those songs or the tunes. And your next choice by the young Irlo Leonard reflects, I suppose, both an imaginary topography and the real landscape of, of West Cork. So it's Ashley and Gale is the song. It was recorded in yeah. 1978 by the then 14 year old from Cool yeah. It's a stunning piece of singing that's full of space. And you can really see what Irla was getting at when he talked about wanting to inhabit ambient landscapes. So what is it about this song or, or, or where did you connect with it? I heard it first, actually, it was around the time when I was in the RTC and I, I think I'd taken on an extra subject, uh, Irish studies. And we had this lecturer and I cannot for the light, his first name was Brian and I cannot for the life of me remember his surname, but he was amazing. Mm -hmm. And he introduced us to um, lots of music. I remember actually he was so, I was so enthusiastic about the classes. I remember he even made me a mixtape. Uh, he made me a cassette right. of some that was recorded uh, of uh, probably his three-in-one stereo from the vinyl records. But it was just, it was just so nice, you know what I mean? He he obviously saw that I was passionate about music and that I was really enjoying the class. So Ashlyn Gal was on it, and I remember him telling me at the time that how the song was recorded. Irla is there's an opening piano note played, mm -hmm. a big a chord is played, and then the young Irla is singing into the open piano. So it's the microphones inside the piano that are picking up his voice. And by holding down the sustain pedal on the piano, which lifts the dampeners off the strings, and by holding down the chord, as Irla is singing, and as he hits certain notes, the open piano strings of that chord are reverberating in the background. So that's what's giving that incredible yeah. harmonic atmosphere in the background. And it's so simple and it's so effective, but obviously like his voice in it is just incredible. Yeah. And the way he sings in the Irish language as well is just so beautiful. There's like a couple of people who sing like that, like um, some voices that are just for me, uh, when I hear them sing in Irish songs, the, the few can match them. Mm. There would be uh, Dolores Keane, Irlo Leonard, of course, yeah. Uh, Andy Irvine, it's just no, there are more that I just there are yeah. just a few off the top of my yeah. head, but uh, Liam O'Wainley, Liam is one of the finest singers in the country, mm -hmm. and when you hear him sing in Irish, like it's it's just beautiful, you know. Yeah, so Irla has that, you know, that song. And when I heard that, I was just blown away by it immediately. And just, just to, to, to ma have made that decision at the time as well that that was enough. Yeah, you know that yeah. it didn't need anybody in the background yeah. on a fiddle or yeah. anything else. It's just that it's just yeah. beautiful. Yeah, right. We'll go on and come back just very briefly because you mentioned him. But uh, thinking about the Dylan thing and thinking about Ireland as well, I was thinking that you know Dylan worked with the Hawks, who then became the band, and then they mm. made a handful of really moving, powerful, and unshowy albums. You know, the end of the sixties, and pretty much at the same time. Planksty were essentially their Irish equivalent in lots of ways. You know, they were the most yeah. unlikely looking bunch. They played odd instruments. And to them, I suppose, tradition was everyone's tradition. Yeah. And your next choice is the Rambling Boys of Pleasure from the 1979 album, the, the After the Break album by Planksty. So the song is sung by Andy Irvin in this case, not by Christy. And and sometimes I think we forget that Planksty, a bit like the band, they were musicians that were comfortable swapping instruments and, and working around the microphone. It didn't have to be one singer or one instrument. So again, I suppose, were Planksty around for you all the time or is it something that you came to? Definitely something I came to um, because, you know, I think with uh, my, the household I grew up in, there wasn't a lot of uh, tradition or folk music. You know, like I described earlier, um, in the house in Dublin where I grew up, it was mostly sort of everything from jazz to pop and mm. a bit of classical and stuff like that. Uh, so there was no folk or traditional music. And then when we moved down to Clare, I started to hear more. And that was mostly um, not recorded music. It was live, you know, in, in the bars there would be, you know, and I was too young to go into the bars, but you'd hear it on the yeah, street. Yeah. You know, we lived on the main street. We had a shoe shop on the main street. And then I started to hear songs that I really liked. And, and then I remember as when I learned guitar, 
I was often called upon to do the mummers on um, St. Stephen's Day. And we'd go out to the old people's home and mm-hmm. out the road and all, and we'd sing songs. So I had to learn. Yeah, Spanfield they didn't, Hill, they didn't want to hear Bo, yeah. all of the, <laughs> the yeah. needle and the damage done. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was definitely um, when I was, I was 13 when we moved down to County Clare. So it was from about that age then, I suppose, uh, folk music. And to a lesser extent, it's tr- traditional, purely traditional music. Um, but they started to kind of seep in. But I think it wasn't until some time later, probably around when we did um, we did the Stunning's debut album came out in 1990, and we got Marching O'Connor to play uh, box. He yeah. played on two songs. So yeah. Marching played he played the box on Romeo's on Fire, mm-hmm. and a song called Roll and Tumble. Mm-hmm. And we we learned one of Marching's songs from uh, he had an album out at the time. I think it was called The Road West, maybe or something. Like that. And uh, so at that point, like I was, you know, I, I was meeting these people in Galway, yeah. you know, but at that point, uh, I mean, I was just really into Planksty and I got to see them as well in, in Vicker Street, mm-hmm. uh, a reunion gig a few years ago. I'll never forget it. It was yeah. just incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I remember talking about that song, Ramblin' Boy's a Pleasure, to Liam O'Mwainley, actually. And Liam said it's, it's, it's quite baroque. In its, and and uh, ever since he said that, uh, you know, anytime I hear it, I picture a kind of a medieval castle and people <laughs> in those sort of Shakespearean sort of velvety <laughs> gowns and stuff and doing that funny step dance yeah. that they did, you know. <laughs> and it's actually, he's right. It's, it's, it's like that. It's got that kind of, I think it's just with the bazookis and the picked, it's so precise. You could just listen to that song forever. Yeah. You know, certainly, like they all brought something obviously to the band and then yeah you know the band themselves became something else you know all of these different parts yeah but you, you can certainly hear it i think with with andy Irvin because of those stringed instruments that he played and you're right i think there's a, there's a precision there's, there, there, it's almost angular at times mm. you know that, that the melodies almost are very formal melodies and yet it's unhurried and his yeah. voice is, like again i think it, here's another one another extremely uh engaging voice and a, an unshowy voice but a hugely yeah. demonstrative voice as well and i also think as well i think it's just that it's in his voice there's a there's a sadness in his voice as well i think that yeah um, yeah it's just he's performing the song the way it needs to be performed and yeah. um just inhabiting the song i guess is, yeah. is what he's up to you know and and, and i suppose in the same way it's a, it's a bit of a transition but it's it's also your your next choice is really interesting one as well, because again it's it's the voice again. This is um, the folks that live on the hill by Peggy Lee, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's it's going back. This is from from 1957. I'm presuming this was one maybe f- from when you were growing up, or is it? Uh, yeah, was this one that was around the house. Yeah, this one that was around the house. It was a real favorite of my mother's, and. Uh she my mother really appreciated good singers and she was a huge sinatra fan listened to lots of peggy lee and she's just one of those incredible singers like sinatra that have this kind of timing they're able they have incredible breath control and they're able to sort of sing a line and maybe join two lines together or three you know with, with, with on the one breath but making it sound quite slow and effortless yeah. chet baker did the same thing but chet's diaphragm was trained from playing trumpet so w- when I was um, uh, preparing for the, the the Chet Baker role in that film, I was doing a lot of singing along to Chet Baker songs, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't e- even listening to recordings he made um, in his later years when he was completely racked with heroin and cigarettes and everything. I still couldn't keep up with him, you know. Yeah. Like on the, on the one breath, I couldn't. Yeah. His control was incredible. Yeah. So um, Peggy Lee had that as well, as, and Sinatra, and, uh, and my mother, you know, she often used to talk about that, that these singers, she would rave about certain singers. I mean, at the time, when, say, myself and Joe were listening to a lot, you know, Led Zeppelin and the Sex Pistols and stuff like that, um, she'd give out to us sometimes. She'd, you know, she'd say, what is that you're listening to if it was, you know, the Sex Pistols? Yeah. Then... Um, we had been listening to a lot of Led Zeppelin before that. And I remember at one point she said to us, she said, will you turn off that crap and put Led Zeppelin on? Because <laughs> she, she hated punk, yeah. but she'd gotten to like Led Zeppelin. And especially the album, um, 
I think is, is it Houses of the Holy? Yeah, and yeah. there's a song on it called The Rain Song, <laughs> which has this incredible orchestral arrangement. And I remember my mother, we were listening to this. My mother re was really sort of pleased that we were listening to <laughs> something that had a classical arrangement, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And just, I suppose, if, like seeing as we're there, do you, like when you're working now as a songwriter, do you hear the thing in your head before you play it? Or um, is it something that tends to develop, you know? So would you just be working on a melody or have an idea or a notion? Does a song come in a particular way or, or do they just arrive in different ways? Yeah, I think they arrive in different ways. There's no rules, but for me, it's, yeah, for me, it nearly always starts with, the the melodic end of things you know with the music and it, it might be it could be a melody that just comes into my head if i'm out walking or something or it could be something i hear that sparks off another idea mm -hmm. i've had this thing sometimes where i i you, you might hear a piece of music in the distance or it's coming out of another room and you hear it differently because you're only hearing yeah. a certain part yeah. of it you know something's missing you're not hearing the whole thing you hear a certain part of it and that goes wow that's really interesting mm -hmm. And I'm adding in the other bits, but it's not. And then I go into the yeah. room to hear what I'm actually hearing. And it's like, oh, it's, it's not a different thing actually, altogether. What, yeah. I had, yeah. what I had in my head was better. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, words tend to come afterwards mm. uh, for me. Uh, and the words then are kind of dictated by the mood of the, the music. Yeah. And I suppose we, we go on. This, this next singer, um, it's John Murray. And the song is Photograph from Murray's Graceless Age album from 2012. And uh, he's a really interesting character. He's he's from Tupelo, but he lives in Kilkenny. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he's a, like, I, I've, I've met John mm -hmm. and um, we message each other a little bit. Uh, we've all, we just met once actually. And um, I was aware of him before I met him, you know, mm. I was a, like a huge fan of, of this record and uh, so he had he had messaged me before that via um, social media, Twitter or something like that. It was just like, uh, love your work, man, or something like that. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, this guy is like a songwriter I really look up to. And he knows yeah. he knows of yeah. me. You know, I was actually really taken aback. So um, we send the odd message to and fro now. And then I, I met him at this party and we got to chat a bit. But I heard that album back then in, in 2012. I had I saw something on. Uh, it was probably uh, on the internet. There's a, a, a magazine called American Songwriter. And I had read a couple of their articles online because there was an amazing interview with Bob Dylan. So, you know, like the way it works on the internet, you look at something once and then it keeps popping up yeah. again. Yeah. So, um, you know, some months later, anyway, this uh, notice of American Songwriters, is that this new uh, this album, The Graceless Age, has been named their album of the mm -hmm. year. And there were some quotes underneath it from the likes of, I think, Springsteen and people like that, just saying this songwriting is, you know, is just par excellence yeah. or whatever. And uh, so I bought the album and I just was blown away by it. I didn't know anything about this guy, never heard of him. And it, there's a sort of a gothic kind of quality to it. I, I, and I don't know why I say that, but there's a sort of, a southern gothic mm. thing like he's very influenced by um william faulkner the writer who's from that yeah. neck of the woods as well and he's obviously um he's well read because his uh, literature references and all are you know you, you can tell the guy knows his, his literature mm. he knows his writers because all of that stuff goes into your subconscious how how different writers explain things and the, the picture they paint with words and I've always tried to do that with songs where it's not just a cerebral thing, like the reading of the lyrics. I always try to sort of, if I'm writing a song, to close my eyes and to actually try and, in my imagination, inhabit the space that the song is in. And John has that. John Murray has that, you know. And there's just there's something about that song, Photograph. I always actually, you know, it's one of those songs I always almost tear up when I hear. I don't know what it is about it, but... It makes me think of, you know, in the last few years, you know, a lot of um, people very close to me died. And that song, Photograph, it just brings it back. Yeah. It just does something, you know, when I hear it. Yeah. I think it's incredible. Yeah, and I think that's, I, I, I think that's, you've summed it up really nicely because I think without over stressing, you know, the, the intellectual side of song, 
sometimes a song for whatever reason just gets its hooks into you and it can have it can have be of huge importance to you emotionally and you know maybe spiritually mm. as well and as you say it mightn't be even the theme of the song or whatever the the intent of the songwriter was i suppose it's your reading of it mm. or, or your listening of it and processing it and yeah. when you hear it and all those other things we kind of have to remember that sometimes that music can be just so much fun yeah okay the last track that you picked uh is delius's the walk to the paradise garden and the version you've picked is, is by the the halley orchestra and it's conducted by is it john barber barber yeah okay sir sir, sir john, john Barberali. Barberali. that's yeah and um yeah uh this is i have to uh, credit my mother here with it because this he was her favorite composer and we as kids used to hear um Delius being absolutely blasted out right. in our house louder than we played Led Zeppelin. <laughs> she would like crank it up. I'm, I was just amazed the speakers weren't blown because classical music, you know, the way it can start off yeah. so quietly. Yeah. And then when it reaches a crescendo and the timpani, and everything all, comes I mean, in, spe yeah. speakers yeah. would be rattling yeah. off the bookshelves. But, um, and it's, it's an incredible piece to hear it develop yeah. and the movements within it. And how does this incredible crescendo in it? It's just absolutely gorgeous, you know. Yeah, and and I think I, I was reading about this piece, which what it's really interesting is like it's it was a, a throwaway piece that he wrote to link a, a scene change um, for the opera. So it's from Romeo and Juliet, and um, yeah. so, and he needed a piece of music to you know for for the scene change, yeah. you know. And this was before <laughs> the you know I mean it was a year before the production, but you know obviously he was getting to the point where he was thinking about staging and so on. Um, but he just he needed several minutes of music. It's yeah, in a gorgeous, it's, it's gorgeous, gorgeous piece of music. Yeah. Uh, we, we again we let people people want to listen to it. Please go to the Gully International Arts Festival's uh, Spotify page, and we have Sir John Barbaroli's conducting off the Halle Orchestra. I think it's also it's a really good example. Just I think of that of not being afraid of different music and allowing the different allowing this music to take you where it is going to take you. Yeah, like I'm not a big fan of all that sort of stuff with. Uh, lots yeah, of brass yeah, like yeah, do, 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 yeah, you know there's this that sort of really yeah. fast kind of jaunty kind of stuff yeah. it does nothing for me but then stuff that uh that my mother used to play like vaughn williams and yeah. and uh, yeah. vorjak and then i started to you know also um uh Mahler. yeah ah uh, yeah it's just as that's the kind of stuff i like yeah. i like the mood yeah. yeah classical music i'm not a big fan of the um yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I think it, it like it fits in with like the, the, your choices earlier. You know, it's it's about this kind of space, and I think it gives you, it, it's it's music that gives you this headspace to, to just to go to go with it. Listen, Steve, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a blast. Thank you for listening to Vine Lars with Steve Wall on First Thought Podcast. Galway International Arts Festival would like to acknowledge the support of its principal funding agencies, the Arts Council and Fulcher Ireland, Galway 2020 European Capital of Culture, Education Partner NUI Galway, Festival Energy Partner Flow Gas and Drinks Partner Heineken. For more Galway International Arts Festival, see GIAF.ie. I'm Tiernan Henry. See you the next time.